Good morning, and welcome to the celebration of American democracy. <laughs> All the housekeeping is done, and now we will go to substance. As we all know, over 40 million Americans have already voted using absentee ballots, postal ballots, early voting, electronic voting, internet voting. The expectation is there will be 100 million Americans in line today to cast their votes through machines and on paper. All of that will be known tonight, and we will elect the next President of the United States. 33 members of the U.S. Senate, 435 members of the U.S. House of Representatives, numerous governors, and I think a majority of members of the state legislatures. And on behalf of all that energy and on behalf of IFAS, I would like to welcome you to our 13th U.S. election program. This program started under my distinguished predecessor, Richard Sudriette, in 1992 when the diplomatic community came to him and said, we need somebody to talk to the uh, local election officials so we diplomats can uh, go around and witness American voting. And then in 1994, he had the bright idea of welcoming uh, people from election commissions and parliaments where IFAS had projects. And now by 2016, we have no room for diplomats. We have over 200 leaders from election management bodies around the world. We have over 100 members of parliament and legislatures. We have over 30 judges, including two chief justices of their courts. And we are particularly honored, and I'm going to get in trouble for this, but I'll at least highlight one former head of state, the former prime minister of the Netherlands joining us here today. You have to be head of state to get a shout out in this crowd, so congratulations. But now we have election day, and it is my great pleasure to introduce two longtime friends of IFAS, the democratic process in the United States, the democratic process around the world, and Bill Sweeney as our panelists. We are going to have a discussion about a great American tradition that these two gentlemen are now the leaders of, and that is the tr now tradition of presidential debates. We have the co-chairs of the U.S. Commission on Presidential Debates. To my left, which is a surprise to both of us, Frank Farenkoff. Frank, as you all know, was chairman of the Republican Party uh, under both President Reagan and President Bush. He was the co-founder of the National Endowment for Democracy. He has been the co-founder of the Commission on Presidential Debates and a personal friend since I first met him when he was Nevada Republican chair in 1982, which is a long time ago. To my right, which is also a surprise to him and me, is Mike McCurry. Mike McCurry is the Democratic co-chair of the Commission on Presidential Debates. He was President Clinton's spokesman. He was Secretary uh, of State spokesman. He was the involved in every presidential campaign, I think, from 1976, 76, uh, all the way through. Um, I have had the pleasure of first working with him, and, and we've frankly been friends so, so long he worked he was the spokesman for two distinguished U.S. senators that I had the privilege of working with, Senator Pete Williams of New Jersey and Senator Daniel Patrick Moynihan of New York. And somewhere in our calendars, we'll figure out where we first met. But two great friends of uh, all of us for many, many years who are going to give us the background and some insight into the presidential debates this year uh, where the commission started and hopefully where the commission is going. I know for many of you, this commission has been a model for debates uh, with, organized by political parties, civil society, in some cases by the election management commissions. And so with that, uh, let me turn it over to Frank and then Mike. 
At the end, we will take questions. Um, this is all live uh, and so, and all on the record. So Frank, take it away. Thank you very much, Bill, and uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, I want to welcome you to the United States on behalf of the Commission on Presidential Debates. Mike and I are going to try to be as brief as possible, give you a little background on what we're looking at in the future in this changing world we live in because of these things. This is an iPhone. Uh, and what the impact of social media has really done to how we go about running our elections. To say the least, we were tremendously pleased with the result of the three presidential and one vice presidential debate in this cycle. I must start out by making it very clear to you that we have nothing whatsoever to do with the primary debates, which uh, I think calling them debates in many ways is, uh, is being very, very kind. Uh, when you have sometimes 16 or 17 people on a stage, as the Republicans had, it really is not a debate. We only do the general election debates. And when you count the people who watched on all the television networks in this country, including C-SPAN, which is not included in what's called the Nielsen ratings, and you count the people who s streamed on their computers or iPads or iPhones, well over 100 million people watched each of the three presidential debates. Now, that wasn't always the case. The history of debates by presidential candidates in this country goes back to 1960, really, when Richard Nixon and John F. Kennedy debated. It was the first televised debates. And they were extremely successful and were, in the opinion of, of most experts, very, very important in how the election came out. Four years later, after the assassination, of John F. Kennedy. Lyndon Baines Johnson was the President of the United States and he refused to debate Barry Goldwater who was the Republican nominee. Four years later uh, and eight years later Richard Nixon was back and because of the traumatic experience that he had in the 1960 debates which was not good for him he refused to debate and it wasn't until 1976 following President Nixon's resignation when Gerald Ford became the President of the United States and he pardoned Richard Nixon and was tremendously hurt in the polls running against Georgia Governor, former Georgia Governor Jimmy Carter, that, that he agreed, President Ford, to debate Jimmy Carter. And they conducted debates and again, the debates were very critical uh, on how people voted. Now four years later, in 1980, it was an extremely interesting time. At that point in time, Jimmy Carter was President of the United States. There was a third party candidate. The debates in 1980 were run by an organization in this country called the League of Women Voters. They had as part of their rules as to who they would invite to participate in the debates something called the 15% rule. Now in order to be included in debates, you have to, of course, meet the constitutional requirements. And the constitutional requirements of being a President of the United States is you must be 35 years of age and you must be a natural born citizen. Uh, that was put in the Constitution by our early founding fathers who were always afraid some rich European would come over and try to take over things and, and become President. So you have to be natural born. And then the League adopted the same rule that we use, the 15% rule. And that is, prior to the debates, you must, at an average, in the five leading polls, be at 15%. If you're at 15%, you're invited to participate. If you're not, you don't participate. At that time, a congressman by the name of John Anderson of Illinois was at 17%. He accepted the invitation to debate. Governor Ronald Reagan of California accepted the invitation to debate. Jimmy Carter, the President of the United States, said, hell no, I won't go. I will not debate if John Anderson is on the stage. So the first debate, which took place about 60 miles down the road from here in Baltimore, was between Ronald Reagan and John Anderson. By the time the next debate came around, Anderson had fallen to 12%. So he was not invited. Jimmy Carter then accepted. And we only had one debate that year between Carter and Reagan. 
Now, we never had any problems thereafter because when Ronald Reagan was president, he had no problem with debating. Uh, Jimmy, excuse me, um, Bill Clinton always loved to debate, so there was no real concern with people being involved and in, in participating. Now, the commission didn't exist, but following the 1984 election cycle, when there was great controversy in the media, particularly over the debates that were held by the League of Women Voters, two commissions were put together, one at the Center for Strategic and International Studies, which at that time was at Georgetown University, and the other was at the John F. Kennedy School uh, at Harvard. And both of those commissions came to one agreement on something, that there should be created an entity that exists for one purpose and one purpose only, to ensure that general election debates are held every four years. I was the chairman of the Republican National Committee at that time, and Paul Kirk of Massachusetts was the chairman of the Democratic National Committee, and he and I, across party lines, agreed to create the commission. And we have done every debate since 1988. The final debate, which was three weeks ago, which was in Las Vegas, was the 30th debate that our commission has run, counting vice presidential debates, eight vice presidential, 22 presidential debates. Now, we had some controversy going into this campaign, and that was because there were two other candidates who were on enough ballots to conceivably get to 270 electoral votes. I left that out. 35 years of age, you have to be on enough ballots in states to conceivably get 270 electoral votes. And we had a Libertarian candidate and a Green Party candidate. And the Libertarians and Greens mounted tremendous public relations tax on the commission uh, for us to not apply the 15% rule and just say that everyone who runs and meets a certain standard of whether, whether they're on ballots or not ought to be included on the stage. Our commission reviewed it in great detail and we held it at 15%. And as you know, I think, Mike can remind me, I think when we first applied the rule, the Libertarians were at eight, I think. And I think the Green Party was at three or four. So they weren't even halfway to, the, to where we were going. Uh, then we, we sat down, as we always do, with the professional teams put up by both campaigns. Both campaigns have debate teams, people who are good with these things, with microphones and sound and lighting and so forth. And they work with our team. And uh, as you know, we went forward. And uh, we're very, very pleased with the, the result. Maybe during the question and answer period, we can get into some of the intricacies that were interesting, to say the least, uh, with these the three presidential and one vice presidential. With that, uh, as I indicated, Paul Kirk was me, the original co-chairman with me when we started this. But when Teddy Kennedy died some years ago, uh, Paul Kirk was named by the governor of Massachusetts to take Ted Kennedy's seat in the United States Senate until such time as a special election could be held to re replace uh, Senator Kennedy. And at that time, Paul had to step down, and we were most fortunate uh, to have Mike McCurry, who had been a tremendous spokesman for President Clinton at a very difficult time in that presidency, uh, step up and be my co-chairman. So Mike, I'll turn it over to you. Thank, thanks, Frank. Um, so just to review a little bit of the work that we do on the Commission on Presidential Debates. we don't receive any funding from our federal government. We are not a government-related uh, entity. It is a uh, nonpartisan, nonprofit uh, organization. And our principal assignment is to really choose the dates and the places where our debates are held. Uh, we design the format uh, to give the candidates uh, some opportunity to present their ideas and their vision for the country. And then we select the moderators who actually step in to uh, conduct the debate. So we have no responsibility for the content of these debates. That is up, for better or worse, to the candidates themselves and to the moderators that pose the questions. So that is our principal as assignment. And if, to review the history that Frank just went through, I would say that the principal achievements that we've made over the time the commission has existed is to really institutionalize these debates as part of the political process here in the United States. Uh, there's nothing that requires candidates to debates. There's no law that stipulates that they have to appear with each other. 
But I think it is now almost a given that the American people expect these debates to happen. It would be very difficult for a nominated candidate in our system now to avoid doing these debates, even though that has happened in the past. But now uh, we almost see the candidates uh, automatically agreeing to the formats, the dates, the design of the debates that we put together. In fact, four years ago, President Obama was the first incumbent president to actually willingly accept uh, the arrangements that we made through the commission without any uh, fussing about it or any debates about the debates themselves. I think that's uh, very, very important. Now, what role do these debates actually play in our process? We know that by the time we conduct these debates in the fall of the general election season, there probably are not that many undecided voters. Most voters have aligned with one candidate or another one way or another. Uh, there are some undecideds. In fact, in this campaign, because of the, its unusual uh, aspects, uh, we probably have a higher degree of undecided voters than we've seen in some of our previous quadrennial uh, election cycles. But I think it, the, the other important thing these debates do, and you saw that in the debates that we had here, is that one, it gives the candidates some chance to articulate what their governing agenda would be once they arrive in office. So they are trying to build some support uh, for the program that they would initiate if they become the president-elect of the United States of America. That's very important. The second thing, and, and you saw a great deal of this in our debates, is that you get some sense of the temperament, the character, uh, the personalities of the president. Now, we, we here in the United States, we obviously don't have a royal royalty, uh, but we do have this unusual character of relationship between the American people and the president we elect, unlike uh, office holders at other levels in our federal or state and local systems. And the American people really, in, you know, they develop a almost personal relationship with the person who becomes president. We get to know the president's personality, uh, style, we get to know the family, we get to know the names of the president's pets, uh, because we do have kind of a personal equation that becomes important. And I think these debates really expose a lot of that. We saw, certainly in the way in which Donald Trump and Hillary Clinton engaged with each other, a lot about their personalities in these debates. So it's almost, in some ways, it becomes kind of a part of a narrative that reflects who we, the people of the United States, are, for better or worse. Uh, looking out at you and thinking about you know, what you would take away from this, I can't say that this campaign that we've had here in the United States of America this year in 2016 has been one that we would hold up maybe as a paragon of democratic virtue. Uh, it has been an ugly, nasty, uh, in many ways very polarizing debate. I think the predominant feeling of most Americans today as they go to vote is that we're just, thank God this thing is over, finally. Um, and that is unlike uh, in many of your systems where you have short campaign seasons, parliamentary systems, much different atmosphere. This campaign here in the United States has gone on well over two years now. Uh, and it probably has not produced the best in what we would call democratic virtue. But I think most Americans, and I'll end by saying, most Americans probably expect something better to come as a result of this. Uh, they expect the new president whoever he or she may be, uh, to rally the country together to try to establish some sense of a common good, and then to really begin to build some consensus around how this country will move forward facing the difficult issues uh, that we face. Uh, the, the one thing I forgot to mention and wanted to cover it too is the work that we do in the commission depends on a collaboration that we have with the five major television networks here in the United States. So all of them together go collectively into what is called the network pool, uh, the major networks, ABC, CBS, NBC, CNN, and Fox, uh, together pool their resources in order to simultaneously broadcast these debates to the entire American public. And that arrangement is probably gonna change. Bill mentioned that we would maybe think about where do we go in the future. Uh, with the decline of the traditional mainstream media and the less influence that these major networks have, I think we'll probably see some reconfiguration of the way in which 
the American people engaged with these debates going ahead in the future. Uh, obviously, the rise of the internet, uh, social media becomes, you know, a very, very critical part of this. This uh, recent series of debates uh, produced the highest number of tweets and responses on Facebook and other social media outlets in the history of our political uh, process here in the United States. Over uh, 83 million people tweeted or went on, on online or went on Facebook to register thoughts or opinions about the first debate and even as there was a decline in towards the end, but even over 50 million people uh, were somehow or other registering their own views as we went through the third debate. And I think in the future we will see much, much more of that. These are going to be much more participatory events with a lot of people, you know, trying to express their own opinions, probably wanting to be engaged in shaping some of the questions that the candidates uh, themselves are asked. So I think we will see as because of partly the changes in technology, the changes in media, uh, a need for us on the commission to think through how we present these debates uh, to the American public because they will no longer be exclusively televised events. There will be something that is much more interactive and much more engaging some of the technologies that I think all of us in this room know are increasingly important in democratic systems. With that observation, Bill, I think I'll turn it back to you and we look forward to having your questions. Thank you, Mike. Thank you, Frank. Uh, terrific first round presentations. <laughs> what I'd like to suggest is we try and have uh, two questions from the right, then two questions from the center, then two questions from the left. I would appreciate it if the questions could be questions, not statements. Um, and I will exercise the right of being moderator to be rude and interrupt. Uh, for uh, Frank and Mike, the translation channel is channel eight. Um, if there's a delay or uh, whatever, I will repeat the question for the benefit of everyone in the audience. Uh, one housekeeping note that I failed to mention and I um, simply want to highlight it to uh, make sure there was, uh, no one was uh, <coughs> concerned. The, the bacon that was served was turkey bacon. There has been no pork um, on the menu of the conference, um, and we did not want anyone to be concerned uh, about that issue. Uh, but uh, it was, I should have mentioned that earlier before breakfast was served. I apologize. I, I had a series of housekeeping notes, and I forgot <laughs> that one. Uh, with that, uh, people with microphones over here. Can we get microphones because we are on television? If, if we don't have microphones, Please. My friend from Uganda. Right next to you. Uh, thank you very much, and I wanted to thank the presenters. I was wondering, knowing that elections depend on, uh, on the goodwill of the people and the perception, do you think that the claim by one of the candidates that elections were rigged and that the process was not fair could have hurt the electoral process, could have hurt uh, the outcome um, of, of uh, today's results. Thank you very much. Second question. Pass the microphone. Thank you. My name is uh, Roma Hurmuzi from Indonesia, uh, chairperson of the United Development Party of Indonesia. Uh, I have two questions. Since there are four candidates, uh, they are from Libertarian and Green Party, if I'm not mistaken, uh, joining in the election. Uh, and of course, is it, it is inside the ballot also. Uh, why the 15% rule still used uh, in, uh, what should I call, uh, only, make only two candidates who join the debates? I mean, people uh, have uh, their rights to know what the views of the other candidates, instead of uh, concerning only eight or two to four uh, percent in the polls, uh, this this is my question because uh, people have to uh, have their right to know what are the views of the, the other two candidates. Secondly, uh, what is the 
the ethics, I mean, kind of norms that used uh, by the uh, commission uh, of the uh, presidential candidate to what is allowed and what is not allowed to express in the, uh, can, uh, in the uh, presidential debates. I think that's all. Thank you. Well, we start off with the question. Yeah. And I think uh, Frank, Frank, start. Mike, respond to, to the first question, please. Let me uh, respond to the last gentleman first. There were over 1,000 people who ran for president of the United States this year, okay? 1,000 who registered with the Federal Election Commission. So we, we have to draw a line somewhere. And as I've said, we debate every four years, we go back and we look at the standards that are applied and whether or not uh, someone will be getting an invitation. The 15% rule, which was the same rule used by the League of Women Voters back in 1980, uh, is the rule that we decided in this election cycle uh, to stay with. And we still think it was the, the correct one when you really look and see what, what occurred. Now, we'll be looking at that rule again, clearly, uh, between this time and the next presidential election. It's hard to believe there's going to be another one already. <laughs> but actually, I think most of you are going to see the next election of, of 2020 will start tomorrow. Some candidates will be out there who are looking down the road, and we will be hearing some speeches probably tomorrow. With regard to what they say uh, when they're answering questions, as Mike indicated, we have no idea what the questions are going to be. Only the moderators know what they're going to ask. And we have no way of controlling what the answers are going to be. And we don't want to control them. We think the American people ought to see the candidate give the answer he or she wants and make a judgment on that. Because as Mike says, we're not electing the best debater, OK? We want to have, through this process, we see someone in a, a debate mode, whether they're standing behind podiums or seated at tables. We want to see them in different uh, formats to make a determination because one thing we know the American people want to like their president they may not always vote for who they think is the smartest person they want to like their president I think they're a little challenged in this election as to where they're going to go but that's the best way I can answer that yeah, let me uh, add a few things about the Commission itself and answer your question about the, the standards or the ethics of the Commission uh, the commission is composed of 16 people. Frank and I are obviously the co-chairs, but we have a, a range of people from all walks of life, business, uh, academics, uh, corporate, and people who have served in political office. Now, of the 16, I, would, I really only can identify the party affiliations of about half the members of the commission. I can guess on a number of them what their political leanings are, but. Uh, people like Father John Jenkins, who's the president of Notre Dame University, or Shirley Tillman, who's the former president of Princeton University, are by and large non-political actors. They're people who have got enormous stature in our system, and they um, obviously carry a great deal of weight. But I think the, the reputation and uh, the quality of the members of the commission themselves is part of what gives us the legitimacy uh, that we have in our system. Now, obviously, I worked for Bill Clinton when he was president. I know Mrs. Clinton very well. And way back at the beginning of her campaign, I made a financial contribution to her campaign. Well, we, the commission later talked about that and thought about that and said, you know, we should not, as an independent commission, a nonpartisan, not a creature of the two political parties, because we are, you know, thoroughly nonpartisan in the work that we do, uh, maybe we should have a a rule that says for the period of our national election we won't contribute to the parties, the candidates, or what we call here in America the super PACs, the political action committees that support those candidates. So we did institute that rule and I think the members of our commission thought that was a, an important ethical standard that we should have so that nobody would question uh, the alliance of this uh, commission when it came to designing the debates which is then the answer to the first question. You know, even though there have been, you know, some commentary during this political season about the process being rigged, I think we uh, were credited with putting together very independent and very fair uh, opportunities for the candidates to present their views. Uh, now, it, some people judged one the winner or one the loser. That is the way our 
commentary goes. We don't make those comments ourselves. Our job, as we've said, is to design the format, present the opportunity, and let the candidates go with the questions and the answers and the moderators as they pose the questions, take the content in the direction they think is in the best interest of the American people. Frank, would you like to add to that? Uh, I agree with everything that Mike just said. I, there have been charges by uh, individuals in this campaign that, that it, this, the system is rigged. Now, I'm going to limit my remarks to the electoral process in the country. I do not believe that the electoral process, what's going on today across this country, with Americans going out 100 million maybe casting their vote today, there probably has already been 40 percent of the public who have already voted. I don't think that process, the voting process, is rigged in any way. In some states, there may be problems with people who shouldn't be voting who vote because they're not properly registered or and, and I remember some cases years ago, dead people were voting in summer. But that is an aberration. The system, I think, is a fair system, and I don't consider it the, the electoral process to be rigged in any way. Okay, can we go to the center? I need two uh, questions. Sí, muchas gracias. Muy buenos días a todas y todos. Yo soy senadora de la República de México. Y bueno, estoy aquí como observadora de estas elecciones, que es una gran oportunidad porque hay un sistema comparado de elecciones entre nuestros países y aquí en Estados Unidos de América. Entonces, mi pregunta es la siguiente. Bajo el esquema actual que ustedes tienen y las acusaciones a las que varios han hecho referencia en torno a la presunta eh, maniobra de tener una, una elección amañada, eh, una situación así, yo nada más quiero decirles, si ustedes no tienen un árbitro nacional, si no tienen un órgano de control global que pueda hacer eh, correctamente las evaluaciones, ¿cómo es que piensan lidiar con todo esto? Punto número uno. Y punto número dos, a mí me parece muy interesante el que Estados Unidos tiene verdaderamente un, federal, un federalismo electoral porque cada estado tiene su propia organización de las elecciones. Incluso hay estados donde se vota por internet, por correo, es decir, hay otros estados donde se puede uno cambiar el voto. Si usted emitió su voto un día y de pronto le, vio, eh, eh, le convenció el, el otro candidato o candidata, usted puede cambiar el voto. Entonces, todo este tipo de federalismo electoral, con, mi pregunta sería, ¿complica los resultados y pueden en un escenario como el que estamos viviendo, un escenario competitivo, un escenario de, de pues prácticamente parejo, en, en muchos de los estados, incluyendo los estados que antes tenían una tradición de un partido o de otro. Entonces, esa sería mi pregunta, ¿cómo lo hacen ustedes? Porque verdaderamente sí, sí en, en esos escenarios de competitividad, sí suena un poco distinto. Muchas gracias a todos. Ok, thank you. Other question here in the center? The chairman from India. Uh, I would like to compliment both the speakers. Uh, Michael mentioned that one of the important roles of these debates is to connect people with the president, to know the personality of the president. You also mentioned that uh, there is a moderator who frames the question. Has the commission thought of connecting president directly with the, with the voters, collect their questions? Number one. Number two, how do, you, how do you moderate that the moderator has framed the right aspirations and expectation of people of this country? Thank you. Let me, uh, let me take the first crack at the last question. Um, we experimented a little bit in this election with how could the American public have more impact or more say in the kinds of questions uh, that the moderators would pose. There was a group called the Open Debates Coalition that did a great job of actually creating an online mechanism for people to register their opinions on certain subjects and questions. And two of our moderators actually injected some of that material into the question they asked. They referenced the, this process that went on. Now, I, I suspect that we will see more of that kind of uh, activity as we go forward because I think people want to feel that they are a part of the process of really defining what the debate is about. Now our moderators, even though they have total control over what the questions are that get asked, 
they're very sensitive to public opinion and they look very carefully at what Americans are suggesting are the primary subjects that uh, they would like to see uh, debated. So I think, you know, we have built into the system because the moderators are responsive to, you know, public opinion. We have built into that uh, some, you know, some assurance that the questions that get posed will be about subjects uh, that people care about as they go through the electoral process. Now, it's not without some shortcoming. It is a personally painful to me as someone who works a lot on issues related to hunger and poverty here in the United States that there was no question about that subject in any of the four debates. Um, similarly, I think we had a, you could argue that for all of us, one of the issues that we have to really think about carefully is the health of our planet um, and global climate change and there was not a thorough discussion of that issue uh, during the debate. So sometimes we do not get entirely the substance in these debates that we would necessarily want. Uh, to the other question, the first question, you know, look, we, we are a, a republic and the design of our constitutional system gives great leeway to our individual states and how elections are conducted. We are we're not going to federalize our election process. Uh, we leave it up to the secretaries of state in each of our states to really administer and design the electoral process and it is a hodgepodge of 50 different designs, uh, each according to the way in which uh, that state conducts uh, their ballots. And there are different rules. There are, there are a number of states today where uh, individual voters could write in the name of another candidate if they wanted you know, to select one of those other candidates that didn't participate in our debates. Uh, but there are some states that don't allow write-in ballots. So we do have this mix, this blend, that I don't see us moving in the direction of a national body that would administer our national elections. Right. And of course that's because as, as all America votes today, it's not just the presidency that we are voting for. We have, you know, obviously candidates at all the different levels of government down to local, state, uh, members of our Congress, members of our U.S. Senate who are being elected today. So by design, I think each jurisdiction has to have its own rules. Let me, let me just add to that. Uh, right after the Berlin Wall fell, with my work with... Uh, an organization called the International Republican Institute, which I started back in 1983, uh, and the National Endowment for Democracy. I traveled uh, all over the world speaking to emerging democracies, and the first thing that I tell them is do not try to emulate what we do in the United States of America. Every country must develop a system that is acceptable to the people, which takes into effect the culture and mores of that society. Ours has been around for a couple of hundred years, and it works for us. There's some rough spots here and there, but it works for us, and it's accepted by our people. It's not perfect, but pretty close to perfect. I think what you're going to see today as you get on the buses and go out to these polling places, you will see, as in almost every state, there's a person who you <coughs> must go up to when you want to vote, and they will ask you your name. Most states require some sort of identification, but at that same table, will be a representative of the Republican Party and the Democratic Party who will have the right to sit there. And they're checking off. So it's a, it's a pro every state's a little different, as Mike says. But uh, our system works for us. It shouldn't be emulated by anyone. Okay, let, let's go to the left for two questions. In the back. This, this can't be the shy side of the room. Way over here. Bonjour. Hi. Thank you for taking my question. Oh, I'll stand up. Um, I'm from Canada, and as you know, we recently had federal elections about a year ago, actually, this time. And I was just wondering, with all the travels you've done and the election systems you've observed, if there's anything you wanted, you think you could incorporate in the U.S. that would improve your, the system that you've seen done abroad? Anything? Anything. One other question from this side, please. I'm, I'm having trouble hearing it. Over here, in front. Hello, I'm Hul from Sri Lanka. You mentioned that at each table there is a member of the a representative of the Re Republican Party and a representative of the Democratic Party uh, present. 
Now, are you not sort of giving, making concrete the system of two parties? What about the third parties who also have some following in this country? Well, yeah, it, certainly if, if they've qualified in that state, in other words, they're on the ballot in that state, you, th they have the right to have someone there also, okay? Uh, with regard to the first question, I think if you asked Americans today what we could gain from looking at other countries and the way they do things, 90% would say, please make it shorter. Please, let's not have four years of this. Let's make it shorter. Unfortunately, uh, that's not going to happen. Uh, our Constitution provides you know, freedom of speech, and people st are going to start speaking, as I said, tomorrow will be the start of the next campaign of 2020. Yeah, just to, to, to really emphasize what Frank said, uh, the ability of a political party representative to be present at the polls to observe the voting is extended to any any party that's on the ballot. I think in most states, correct, Frank? Mm -hmm. So if you, uh, we have, for example, I vote nearby here in the state of Maryland, and we have on our ballot the People's uh, Republic of Maryland. We call it <laughs> Republican Party. We we have a we have. Uh, multiple candidates who are listed on our ballot, not just the four that we have been described. We have other people who qualified for the ballot in uh, Maryland. So representatives of the Green Party or the Libertarian Party would be fully entitled to have a poll watcher there. Uh, the, <coughs> the two major political parties do this as part of their mechanism for turning out the vote, what we call get out the vote or GOTV, because they are checking off the names of their supporters who have voted, and if they see that someone has not yet voted, who they anticipated would be supportive of their candidate, they go get on the phone and make sure that person goes to the polls. That's part of the mechanism for turnout. But back to the first question, you know, we have, you know, not, not a very um, impressive rate of voting among people who are eligible to vote in this country. I think we get. Uh, in a presidential election probably today, what, Frank, about 67 to 70 percent maybe of the... You, you would hope. You would hope, yeah. It's going to be interesting this time. 55 or 60. Yeah, 70 is a little high. Yeah. At best, uh, Mr. Sweeney says. I th so, you know, that's a pretty stunning statistic that, you know, almost half of those who are eligible to be participating in this uh, democratic process today choose not to. Now they're, they're entitled to choose not to. They might be turned off. They might not want to participate. But um, there are systems that have required voting. Um, and there are sometimes, part of me says, I would really like for people to feel like it is part of their citizenship duty to participate in these elections. Whether we would ever legislate something like that as it is legislated in some of your countries, I, I just don't know, probably not, uh, in, given the, our system and given the fierce independence that many people uh, want to have, but I think that is something that we would incorporate. We also, there are other systems, I, I, I think this is maybe true in Canada, that make it far easier to be registered to vote. It becomes almost an automatic uh, process. Uh, there are some states here in the United States where if you apply for your driver's license, you simultaneously can register to vote. There are ways in which that's happened, but we also have had in this country a very sad history of discrimination against people, particularly minorities, and we still have uh, states in which the Justice Department supervises and monitors electoral participation because of the history we've had going back to Jim Crow uh, laws that really prohibited uh, participation by uh, African Americans in particular. So there are things that I think we could do to certainly improve our electoral process here in the United States. I, I would actually like to see Election Day be made a holiday so that people wouldn't have to worry about wh how can I vote, I'm working, and how can I get there, and, uh, and that sort of thing. I, I, I've, I've suddenly come to that conclusion that that would be in the best interest of the public. Or, or voting even on weekends. I mean, why do we pick the second Tuesday? Well, in but, you, but with weekends, you're starting to interfere with golf. <laughs> <laughs> or, or football. <laughs> I'm, going, I'm going to ask the uh, speakers to restrain themselves. Uh, 
One, one comment about observers, uh, depending on the state law, you will also have uh, NGO or nonpartisan, such as League of Women Voters, uh, or cause-oriented groups from the environment or, or other interests have registered observers uh, in addition to uh, representatives of the political parties and candidates on the ballot. So just as in many of your countries, you can walk into a polling station and there are more observers than there are poll workers or voters, that also happens in this country depending on the state law and depending on the nature of the contest in, in that particular uh, community. Bill, uh, can I, can I add something that Mike and I both forgot to mention in our prepared remarks? And that is that the Commission on Presidential Debates for the last 20 years have been working with countries all over the world, many countries represented in this room, mm -hmm. in helping train people to create the same site, sort of entity uh, in, your, in, in those countries so that there'll be presidential debates or what, whatever the office might be called uh, uh, before elections take place. In fact, at the final debate uh, in Las Vegas, uh, we had 50 representatives from 35 countries who have these sorts of commissions or are working in creating the commissions who were our guests and went through a three-day process of, of meetings and, and consultation uh, and also attended the debate. And I would, I would add that that is a very interactive process because when we go out and assist, provide technical assistance in other countries that are designing and developing their own debates, we actually then get back some ideas when we see innovation and uh, new things happening that we should be aware of or think about in the design of our own debate. So it is actually a very two-way interactive process. And I would simply second that. I know at least two groups in this, organ in this audience have had meetings with the professional staff and, and people who've been part of that training process uh, as part of their visit here to Washington. We're now going back to the far right. We've got one question here and the question at the table behind him. So please hear it. Je voudrais poser deux questions. La première, euh, après 20 ans de fonctionnement, d'existence de la commission, au jour d'aujourd'hui, nous avons vu tout à l'heure quels sont les côtés positifs de ce débat, mais quels sont les côtés négatifs que vous avez relevés depuis une vingtaine d'années La deuxième question, elle est relative aux difficultés justement de montage de ce, de ce débat. Quels sont les problèmes auxquels la commission est habituellement confrontée pour l'organisation de ces, de ces débats. Merci. Well, the things right. have really changed. Well, oh, I, we got the, the other question. Let's yeah. get the other Sorry. question in. My no problem. problem. Yeah. Uh, I would like to be informed on how the uh, incumbency influences the process of elections in this country. When president, um, the president, the current president goes out to campaign, does he use Air Force One? When the vice president goes out to campaign, uh, does he use the perks of office? Uh, because uh, where we come from, I come from Cameroon, I'm the chairman of the Electoral Commission of Cameroon. There is always this complaint about the use and abuse of office in the electoral process. Okay. I'll, uh, I'll start with that, with that second question, then work my way to the other questions. Um, we have a very complicated formula that is used in the United States when the incumbent president campaigns for office in which the costs are apportioned on the political side versus the official business side. So there is a reimbursement that comes when President Obama has been campaigning the last several days, uh, a portion of the cost of the use of Air Force One and the travel expenses for his campaign trip will be apportioned uh, to the political side and will be paid usually by the Democratic National Committee. The, the Democratic Party will pick up that cost. But the president also usually does official business in the course of travel and there are people that are required uh, to travel with the president for protection and for assistance and for communications purposes and those are deemed to be official expenses and they get paid by all American taxpayers, but it is, you know, by and large a pretty time-honored system that has worked through different political parties having uh, the White House and the presidency, and, and it works and is administered by 
our Federal Elections Commission, and uh, there's rarely much dispute about the way in which that happens. Uh, going back to the, the, uh, the first questioner, um, I, I think there are some negative sides. We, of course, stress the positive experience of having the two candidates there to engage each other uh, side by side and debate the future of the country. But uh, having been on the candidate side, having helped prepare Bill Clinton for his debates in 1996, sometimes there is too much attention to the theatrical aspect of these debates, to the short sound bite that will sound good on television, and less on the substantive presentation of a program or ideas or a platform. And um, I, th I think we saw some of that during these debates. Uh, the number one recommendation that I'm hearing from people who watch the debates is that they wished the microphone for the candidate who is not the candidate's turn to speak would be turned off so that they're not talking over each other all the time. We had, you know, sometimes the, the debates themselves were a little chaotic when Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump decided that they wanted to argue with each other and it was not maybe as orderly as some people would have liked. So I think that's, a, uh, that's an area where, you know, again, it's the candidates' debates, it's not our debates, but uh, uh, how they behave during the debates is something that I think a lot of people in America had some concern about. And the, the other, you know, what problems have we encountered in the 20 years? You know, we rely on the places that host these debates to do an awful lot of work and to raise an awful lot of money, frankly, uh, to help host these debates. So each of the colleges or universities that we pick have to go out and do fundraising to equip the facility, to make the arrangements, to have the security necessary, to arrange transportation and, and prepare their facility for what is a huge global media event. And I think that becomes difficult. Some, sometimes you know, some of our uh, host sites have had experienced some difficulty in doing that. So that, that's something that it just happens to be our model. We don't, the Commission on Presidential Debates doesn't raise all the money necessary to put on these debates. We leave it to uh, the, the institutions that we select to host the debates to do a lot of that work. But I think that is probably in the, in the realm of what's difficult or challenging about the work we do, that would probably be very high on the list. Let me just add that, <clears throat> actually, it's been longer than 20 years. I just, it, the commission's been in existence for 29 years. Next year will be our 30th anniversary. And <clears throat> things have changed dramatically from when we first started. As you can imagine, the campaigns and the parties weren't always happy that there was a commission, an outside group coming in in the last months of a presidential campaign and saying you will show up on this night at this place and you will debate your opponent. They don't like the interference of outside organizations. And so it was at the very beginning, Chairman Kirk, Paul Kirk and I uh, had with the candidates and the parties what we called the debate over debates. It was always a question of where it was going to be, when it was going to be, who the moderators were going to be. But slowly, we did two steps forward, one back for many, many years until we reached 2000. And in 2000, we reached the point where we pick the dates, we pick the locations, we pick the format, and we pick the moderators without any consultation with the candidates or the political parties. So we've reached a point of total independence. But there was certainly uh, uh, difficult times in the early years, but uh, thank God that's beyond us. Before I go to the center, let me follow up with one question that I know has been puzzling people. How, as more and more Americans are voting earlier, and perhaps with the introduction of technology, we're going to see even more Americans vote earlier, either electronically or on the internet or using other devices, um, how do you select the debate dates? And when do you select the debate dates so that the candidates can work their schedules but still have enough time to present their views to the American people and the debates have an impact on that voting decision? And then I will go to the center for the next two questions. Well, 
this cycle w was very, very different for both the, the commission as well as the political parties. Historically, the campaigns, excuse me, the, the, the parties have held their conventions in late August, early September. But because of the early voting factor, we knew that uh, four years ago, 40% of the people had voted before election day, and that number is probably right about where we are right now. The, the camp, the, uh, the parties moved their conventions into July, moved them forward. Now we also made a change. Historically, our debates have been in October. We moved what, the first debate into September, but it's a factor that we we really are wrestling with, with uh, one of the things that early voting uh, does provide is that challenge. It doesn't do a hell of a lot of good if you're holding the debates after most of the people have voted. So you want to, uh, our function is an educational function. We're trying to help educate the American people as to who the candidates are and why they, where they stand on important issues that should be taken into consideration in casting your ballot. So it's something that we're going to have to deal with, I think, uh, and Mike and I and the other members of the commission four years from now because I think technology uh, is going to maybe demand that we move those debates a lot more forward. Our, our final debate, the, four, uh, the third presidential debate, was on October 19th. And I think it is true, if I have looked at uh, the literature on this correctly, that most early voting uh, takes place in the two to two and a half weeks before the election date. So there are some states in which you could uh, vote earlier than that. Certainly there are some states that allow for absentee ballots to be sent prior to that. But I think most of the, so a quote unquote early voting probably occurred after our final debate. Um, I've had some people ask me why did, why was the final debate three weeks ago, three weeks before the election? Because they wanted to see Trump and Clinton presumably debate again sometime as we were in the final days of this campaign. But one reason for that is that we, uh, because of early voting and also because the campaigns themselves uh, like to build off of the debates to then present their final arguments to the voters. So we thought October you know, 19th you know, was a reasonable time to allow the candidates then after that third debate to, to wrap up and make their final presentations to the voters as they saw fit. But th that is something I think as Frank indicated that we will have to examine that schedule and think about the reality of the fact that many, so many millions of Americans now are voting uh, earlier than the election day itself. I need two questions from the center. Over here. And Thank you. My name is Sausi Wright from Indonesia. Assalamu alaikum. Just one question. Early morning, I just read in CNN on TV, at CNN, a caption. Justice Department sent to 12 states a monitor. My question is, what is the role of Justice Department in the America election system. Thank you. Thank you. And over here. There we go. Terima kasih. Saya Reni Marlinawati, Ketua Fraksi Partai Persatuan Pembangunan DPR RI. Saya datang ke sini sangat antusias dengan empat alasan. Yang pertama, Amerika mencatat sejarah baru dengan memiliki kandidat presiden perempuan, yaitu Hillary Clinton. Di Indonesia, banyak lembaga swadaya masyarakat dari Amerika yang menginisiasi tentang kesetaraan gender. Tetapi ternyata di Indonesia sendiri perlu waktu hanya 50 tahun untuk kita, kami, bisa mempunyai presiden perempuan. Sementara di Amerika, perlu waktu sampai 200 tahun untuk bisa mendapatkan, 240 tahun persisnya untuk bisa mendapatkan presiden perempuan jika Hillary dalam pemilu kali ini berhasil. Lalu yang kedua, saya ingin bertanya tentang etika pengumuman hasil polling. Apakah ada etika 
Dan apakah ada ketentuan para donatur untuk mengumumkan kepada publik tentang sumber dana dan bagaimana etika yang ditetapkan kepada lembaga polling tersebut. Okay. Berikutnya, okay. apakah KPU juga melaksanakan debat selain komisi yang ada pimpin ini? Terima kasih. Um, if I get, I, I was asking Bill, I didn't quite catch the first question, but I think the, the question was the Justice Department uh, deploys uh, people under our federal law, civil rights law, to monitor uh, voting patterns and, and uh, activities in certain states uh, that are covered under uh, provisions of our Civil Rights Act. And I think that they have done that. They've deployed people to uh, be on hand and be available if there are allegations of voter intimidation. There are very strict rules about uh, uh, not intimidating people who are exercising their franchise to vote, and that's taken very, very seriously. And there are uh, Justice Department monitors and people in state uh, law enforcement agencies who are available uh, if there are any allegations that people are being uh, prevented to ex exercise their opportunity to vote. So that's taken very seriously, and I think the Justice Department has made clear uh, that they're going to uh, be engaged in that. Um, <clears throat> on, the, on the second set of questions, I didn't quite catch the question about, I think the question was, why it had a, has it taken so long for the United States to actually seriously consider a female uh, candidate for president? And I think that's a, a peculiarity of the rhythm of our own political cycle and the people who have been available to run. Uh, but curiously, the fact that we might in fact elect our first female president today has received less attention uh, in the public discussion about this campaign than one would have imagined. I think that if, if Mrs. Clinton is elected today, there will probably be much more attention going forward on the fact that we have made that that kind of history today. But obviously we'll have to wait and see uh, how that works. On the question of the disclosure of funding, we have throughout our political system uh, pretty high standards of disclosure of campaign contributions required of candidates and parties. The, the uh, people who contribute to the Commission on Presidential Debates, which has relatively small budget because, as I mentioned, most of the costs of the debates themselves are borne by the colleges and universities that host the debates. But the money that we do raise in order to maintain our staff and do some of the work uh, that we do is disclosed in the forms that we file with the Internal Revenue Service of the United States of America. It's a, a form called the Form 990 form. So most of our contributions that are given are disclosed in that document. Uh, Frank, you're fine with them. Let's ask the, these will be the two last questions. Our friend from Australia and the lady at the same table, please. Thank you, thank you very much. I am Constance from Zimbabwe. My question is on issues relating to vote buying. The public debates have made sure that the Americans get to know their president to be. But from the debates, especially the current ones, there was some kind of character assassination, short of the correct word uh, to use. How does the American system ensure that as a result of this, there is no vote buying afterwards? Because somebody would have been assassinated through the public debates and goes back to the party, to the big donors, and gets money to actually try and right the ill that has come through. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, good morning. I'm, D I'm uh, Dennis Cowdroy from the Australian Electoral Commission in Canberra. My question is this. Uh, if the uh, 2020 election campaigning begins early, as you predict, 
the use of electronic communication could become predominant as the means of communication to the public and particularly potential voters. We are told that free speech uh, will mean that um, there can be little done about that to curb that or control it. But what regulation is there to curb an abuse of that right of free speech? If, for example, parties or groups made absolutely false or misleading information uh, which was disseminated to the voters, what can be done to prevent that at a national level? <laughs> Frank's deferring. Let the press secretary answer that. Two very difficult questions um, to me to begin with. And they both go to the unique character of this 2016 presidential election here in the United States. It has not been an uplifting, inspirational occasion. Uh, in the history of this country. It has been, frankly, one of the meanest and most bitter and most toxic presidential campaigns that, that I remember. And as Bill was gracious enough to say, I've worked on campaigns going back to 1976, usually for the losing candidate, by the way. Um, <coughs> Thank God. <laughs> and I, I don't know the answer to the questions that you both posed. There, is, there has been enormous personal levels of insult, character assassination is what our uh, questioner called it, and it has been among the things that has made this a dispiriting exercise for most Americans. I think most Americans would agree with the statement that we are happy that this campaign is coming to an end today because it has not been a good example of what spirited debate looks like in a democracy. And I, I hope and pray that your countries provide the world better examples than we have provided in this election of how people uh, need to conduct themselves in a democracy. Uh, so uh, the only hedge against the kinds of false statements, mistruths, bad information. Uh, today there's an article in one of our local newspapers about fake news, news reports that appear to be uh, real but in fact are entirely fabricated. Uh, the answer to that for our system is our First Amendment to the Constitution and a vigorous free press. The fact that we have a media that can expose lies and falsehoods and character assassination when it occurs and bring that to the attention of the American people is the bulwark that we have against um, things that would take our democracy in a bad direction. Now, the relative strength and power of the media has been in decline in this country because of all the changes in media and technology and the way in which people access content, but I think if you talk to journalists and editors and publishers and, and producers and executives of our media organizations, they understand the critical responsibility they have to be the watchdogs for the freedom that we have to conduct ourselves uh, as a democracy. And there will be a lot of discussion in the aftermath of this election and the role the media has played to try to call the candidates on statements that have been made that are not true. And there will be probably a very spirited debate about what types of things should happen the next presidential election to ensure that we don't have as depressing a campaign as the one that is ending today. Let me end this by saying that whoever wins this election and becomes the next president of the United States has a tremendous challenge and opportunity before him or her, whoever wins it. This country is divided as I've never seen it divided, and I've been in politics as long as Mike. I've been through a lot of presidential campaigns and other campaigns. Whoever wins this election has an obligation to try to bring this country back together again. 
I have tremendous confidence in the American people. Tremendous confidence in them. And the overwhelming majority, in my view, overwhelming majority of Republicans, Democrats, and Independents will reach out and support whoever wins this election in trying to get the job done. There will be people who will yell and scream, but they always do. But I am convinced that if the next president uses this as an opportunity to reach across party lines, to stop the deadlock that has existed in this city, in Washington, D.C., for so many years, work together, for example, uh, as Ronald Reagan did with Tip O'Neill, the Speaker of the House, in reaching across party lines to save uh, the social security system back in the 80s. It's that sort of opportunity that is before the next president. I have confidence the American people will rally and will give that president the opportunity to get something done. And I'm hopeful that that'll happen. Thanks so much for you guys coming. And I hope you learn and enjoy your visit here. Please join me in a round of applause for two great American public servants from two great political parties who have devoted their lives to improving the quality of debate and democracy in this country. Our country is built on a culture of political trust. The hard work that these two men and their colleagues have done in creating a tradition of a commission on presidential debates has resulted in the opportunity for all Americans to get to know their potential presidents, their candidates for president, on a personal basis and make a personal judgment about who they wanted in their homes every day for the next four years on whatever type of media they were consuming. Uh, this contribution, and particularly the eloquent end, is really a great way for us now to transfer to the next stage of this conference and go and actually witness Americans vote. But please join me in one last round of applause for Mike McCurry and Frank Farncock. <laughs>